Wow, what a message and song. Well, we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, not our version of the gospel, but God's only true version of the gospel to this lost and dying world. Or will we be sleeping and judgment day come and many people will go to a real hell forever because we would not share the love of God that has been shared so graciously with us. If you have your Bibles this morning, Romans chapter 5, really hope you have a copy of God's Word to turn to this morning. Take out the sermon handout that's in your connection as well. There'll be some notes on that as well, but I want you to see it out of your copy of God's Word this morning because I have nothing to offer you of any value on my own, but when we let God's Word speak to us, we have the greatest Word of all coming from our Heavenly Father this morning. I'm in a series, if you're new with us, on Sunday morning. Thank you for coming to worship God with us at First Baptist Church, Slidell. We're a church that seeks to glorify Christ, Christ-centered in everything that we do. That's our goal. We don't want to focus on ourselves. We want to focus on Jesus Christ because he alone is worthy. And so I'm preaching through a series entitled, Who Is I Am? When Moses was talking with God and God calling Moses to lead the people out of Israel, Moses said to God, who do I say? sent me. And God says, tell them I am who I am sent you. I am everything that you need me to be. It comes from that verb to be. So we're in this series, who is I am? We want to see who God is in his word, because when we understand who he is in his word, we'll understand ourselves for who we really are in his word. And we'll give him the praise that's due his name and not try to draw glory unto ourselves. You're in Romans chapter 5. I will be there momentarily. The whole theme verse for this sermon series, Who is I Am, Who is the Great I Am, comes from Jeremiah 9, verses 23 and 24. It's on your handout as a scripture reference, but it's on the screen as well this morning. Verse 23, thus says the Lord. God says it. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. It's all the things the world boasts about in the flesh. Verse 24, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. The same word to be there. Who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. God says, here's what I say is important. Don't boast about what the world boasts about. If you're going to boast about one thing, boast about knowing personal relationship with the great I am, our King of kings and Lord of lords. First question that we've been reciting each week in this series comes from the Westminster Catechism, a doctrinal statement to teach people who the great I am is from the word of God. And that question that I want you to answer as we've answered every week now in this series is this, what is the chief end of man? Jeremiah 9 says, if we're going to boast, boast about knowing the great I am in a personal way, the more we know God, the more we'll glorify God. The more we glorify God, the more we'll enjoy our daily walk with him. Even through suffering, even through persecution, even through trials, we'll enjoy our walk with him because we understand him for who he really is. Satan is the great deceiver. He has us so often deceived with a false view of who God really is. We hear a lot of preaching today, unbiblical preaching that talks about these different things that God is. We hear a lot of unbiblical teaching about what heaven, heaven is all about. Only thing we know for sure is what God's word says. Not what a movie says, not what a, a writer of a book says. The only thing we know for sure is God's holy word. So let's study God's holy word. What's the definition of love? If you look in the scriptures, the best definition from the scriptures, and I'll show you several references here in a moment, for what God is love is all about. His love means that God eternally gives himself to others. An odd definition, I know. But God is love means God puts us in a position to give us things to show us his love. Here's a few examples of that. Psalms 36, verse 7. How precious is your steadfast what? 
O oh God, the children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. One thing that God gives us is refuge. When he saves us, we are protected from the enemy. We are protected from hell. We have the gracious love of God. The greatest gift of love is Jesus Christ, God's son, who offers us salvation. Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. God gave us his faithfulness as an expression of his love. 1 John 4, 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. Here's how God showed his love to us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and sent his son, and I love this phrase, to be the propitiation for our sins. Halasmus in the Greek, which means expiation for our sins. It means a sin offering, that something was offered in our place for our sins. The great exchange. That shows the love of God. That God would give himself to us and take the punishment that we deserve to take on the cross. Of course, the greatest love verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Oh, does God love us. This will be the favorite sermon in this whole message series. I'm sure in two weeks when I preach on God is wrathful, that's not gonna be a very big hit on YouTube. We're going to look at all the attributes of God. But if we don't realize what we're saved from, then we won't understand the love of God. So there's four basic points, very simple from Romans 5 this morning. God's love is going to show us who we really are. God's love is going to show us who he really is. God's love is going to show us what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross at Calvary. And then God's love is going to show what our response should be back to God for what he's done for us. God's love should change the way we live our life. We understand his love. Romans 5. Your handout has verses 6 through 11. That's our focal passage but I don't ever want to take a passage out of context, so I'm going to back up to begin chapter 5 and verse 1. I want you to see this in your copy of God's Word. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, when you see the word therefore, you have to ask yourself, what is it there for? First three chapters of Romans is all about condemnation, that we are all sinners. We all deserve the wrath of God. Not a very popular subject in the first three chapters of the book of Romans. Many people never get through the first three chapters to get to the really good stuff towards the end of Romans. But we are all condemned. We're all condemned to hell forever from the moment we were born, but for the grace of God. And you've got to understand this. When we are saved... What are we saved from? The wrath of God. Boy, it got quiet quick. God's wrath will be poured out on us for being sinners in a place called hell forever. Why? Because he's a righteous, just, holy God. There must be a punishment for sin. So what are we saved from? When we tell somebody you need to get saved, what are we saved from? God's wrath. We are saved by God from God. We need to understand that to understand the love of God. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, verse 1, meaning because God saved us from the penalty of sin, he's justified us, he's declared us not guilty. This is after salvation now. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have also obtained access by faith and to his grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. We count it a privilege to suffer for God because he's justified us. He saved us. Knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Now listen carefully to verse 5. I should have put it in your handout. 
And hope does not put us to shame because God's what? Love. This is the greatest love chapter if you think about it, Romans 5. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. How? Through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God has saved us. If you're saved this morning, then he has given you his love. His love has been poured out by the power of the Holy Spirit in you that lives in you, that resides in you. And verses 6 through 11 talk to us about the results of God's love. Verse 6 of Romans 5 that will now be on the screen. For while we were still weak, this is talking to people that have already been saved. They've already been justified. For while we were still weak before salvation, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. Verse 8, but God showed his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of who? What are we saved from? God's wrath. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by Christ's life. In verse 11, more than that, if that's not good enough, more than that, we also rejoice in God. Why? Because of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We've been brought back to God, reconciled to God through Jesus' death, burial and resurrection punishment that he received for my sins and for yours god is a god of love so god's love number one shows us who we really are i truly believe that church in america today has stopped teaching the true gospel of jesus christ we're afraid the gospel is going to offend people we're afraid if we tell somebody who they are apart from Christ, they won't like it. So we skip over what we call as a very important doctrine, the doctrine of the depravity of human beings. Who we are apart from Christ. Look what the Bible says we are. If we understand the love of God, if you want to rejoice in your salvation, you need to realize what you've been saved from. The book of Romans is like this. The book of Romans is often described as a diamond. The gospel, the greatest treasure of all. But you know what a diamond, when you go to a jewelry store to look at a diamond, you know what they always put the diamond in? A box with what color backdrop? Black. Why? Because it shows how the diamond stands out in all its glory. The first three chapters of Romans is all about we're condemned as sinners, we're enemies of God, we're ungodly, we're, we deserve the wrath of God, and the portrait that's put on display is the blackness of sin. So when the gospel comes on the scene, we see how great the gospel is on the backdrop of who we really are. So unless we tell people who they really are, they don't appreciate the gospel. They don't realize what they're saved from. So let's just take God's word for God's word. Who are we really apart from Christ? Number one, we're powerless, Scripture says. ESV says we're weak. It's, it's, a, it's a verb used to apply to sick and feeble people that need healing. And then when you talk about it spiritually, it means we are sick and depraved. We can't save ourselves. We are weak human beings. We have no power on our own without Christ. That's who we are from the moment we've been born into this world. Sinners. We are ungodly, number two. Do people like to be told they're ungodly? You ask people today, they're pretty good people. Hey, I'm a pretty good person. I was raised in a Christian home. I, I, people tell me this all the time, and it, I, I try not to laugh. Thinking about a diamond, somebody put something right up here. It looks like a diamond. Where'd that come from? The providence of God, maybe? If you lost a diamond, there might be one right there. Upstairs. We tell people, people tell me this all the time. You know, I, I don't know when I became a believer in Jesus Christ. I was born a believer in Jesus Christ. Obviously, they don't understand the gospel. Obviously, they don't understand who they were apart from Christ. We are all born into this world, evil, ungodly, powerless to save ourselves. Number three, this passage says that we are sinners, meaning we're in desperate need of a change that we can't make on our own. 
And number four, this is not a very popular teaching today, but it's the word of God. Number four, we are, in verse 10, enemies of God. We deserve the wrath of God, Ephesians 2 says. We're his enemies. When you understand the love of God, you'll understand who we are apart from Christ. And you'll understand why people need to understand their depraved condition. Most people today will not get saved because they don't think they need saving from anything. We are enemies of God. We are sinners deserving hell. We are ungodly. We are powerless. I was praying the other day in, at the Senate in Baton Rouge and Senator A.G. Crow asked me to come up and pray. So I'm driving down there thinking, you know, I've never been at prestigious events. I'm not a prestigious person. So what am I gonna pray when I get there? I, I didn't write my prayer down. I wasn't trying to impress anybody. So I pulled up in the parking lot, not knowing where to go at the Capitol building there in Baton Rouge to pray. And I thought, I'm just going to praise God for who he is. I'm just going to tell him how great he is. They said, you have five minutes to pray. I said, I probably won't pray over a minute. You know, I'm just going to tell God how great he is. So I started praying and just praising God for who he is, asking God to give wisdom to the people as they made decisions for the state. And then I prayed this. I said, God, thank you for not giving us what we deserve. And when I prayed that, a couple of senators on the front started laughing. When they started laughing, I had my eyes closed. I was praying. I thought, I must disagree with that. And so I said, God, thank you for not giving me what I deserve. And thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. I love you. Amen. And as soon as I said, amen, those, those senators made a beeline up to me on the platform and they came up and they say, that was, we've never heard anybody pray that before. And I was like, what part? And they said, thank you, God, for not giving us what we deserve. And then he starts smiling. He says, we deserve hell. He was laughing because he agreed with me in the prayer. And he came up to me to help me understand he wasn't making fun of me. He said, we all deserve hell, but if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd all be there, wouldn't we? That's who we are. And even after we're saved, we need to preach that to ourselves even more because we need to live every day thankful that we do not get what we deserve because we're ungodly. We're sinners. We are enemies of God apart from Christ and the gift that can only be found through him. Number one, we understand God's love. It reveals to us who we really are apart from Christ. Number two, God's love defines who God is. Romans 5, 8. But God showed his love for us in this, that we were still sinners. Christ died for us. We need to understand how holy God is. We send, I think, a false message today that God is a God of love, so that means when everybody gets to the judgment day, they're going to say, God, I never trusted in you, I never worshipped you, I never believed in you. God, I'm sorry, and God's going to be a benevolent God because he loves everybody. It's okay, just come on into heaven, and everybody's going to be saved. No, we understand the love of God. We see ourselves for who we are, and we see God for who he is. He is just. He is righteous. If somebody goes to the court of law and they're guilty of a crime, then if a judge is 100% just, 100% righteous, 100% holy, there must be a punishment for sin. There must, or God's not righteous. He's not holy. He's not just. But God loves us so much that he doesn't give us what we deserve. There must be a punishment made, so he just puts it on his own son, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. The great exchange. We cannot teach people today this universalistic belief that everybody's going to go to heaven because everybody's not going to heaven. Scripture teaches, and Jesus said it, and I preached the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We're not saved by our works, but people that love God live for him because they love him. Not legalistic. It's based on love. 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Do you understand how great God is, how holy he is, how just he is, how righteous he is, how gracious he is all at the same time? See, God's love is wrapped up in all these things. His love is made manifest because of his wrath. We deserve his wrath, but he gives us his grace. God's love shows me who I really am apart from Christ. God's love shows me who God really is, that while I was in my worst of sins, Christ came and took my place. Number three, God's love will help me understand even better what God has done for me on the cross at Calvary. 
it's, to me, sad. It's comical, but it, it's sad to hear Christians today boast about what they do for God. How much they give to the church, how much they serve God. They boast about all the things they do for God. It's not about what we've done for God. It's about what God has done for us. Because we can't do anything apart from his righteousness that he places in us when he saves us. And the gospel is not about what we do for God. The gospel is about what Jesus did for us on the cross at Calvary. And when we tell people the plan of salvation and miss out on the man of salvation, Jesus Christ, then we've got it all backwards. We teach people today the plan of salvation, but we never introduce them to the one who made the great exchange in their place, Jesus Christ. It's all about him. It's not about us. So Romans 5 verse 9 tells us what God has done for us in several different phrases in those two verses. Let me read those again to you. Romans 5 verse 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, by Christ's blood that was shed on the cross, we have been declared not guilty. Much more shall we be, and notice this phrase, saved by him from what? The wrath of God. Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, it's who we are apart from Christ, we were, here's what else Jesus did for us. He reconciled us to God. How? By the death, by Jesus' death, much more, now that we are reconciled, notice this phrase, shall we be saved? How? By, based on what we do? No, based on Christ's life. Look at what Christ has done for us. Justified us by his blood, saved us from the wrath of God, reconciled us to God, and we've been saved not because of what we do, but for what Christ has done through his life and his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. We need to return to the biblical gospel today and teach people who they are apart from Christ so they'll know they need salvation from the only place it can be found, Jesus Christ. Do you understand what it means for someone to die for you when you're their enemy? Let me see if I can help you understand that a little bit better. Let's say that we're in a battle. We have some soldiers that have been captured by the enemy. They've been in prison for years. And a group of military personnel come into this enemy's camp. They're breaking out those prisoners. They're rescuing their men and women that have been in captivity. And when they get there, there's a battle that ensues. And one of the enemies throws a grenade in, and the captain of one of the rescuing squads dives on that grenade to keep the rest of his men and women from exploding. We would all say that was a hero. We would all say that somebody who gave their life for someone else because they loved them, because they served with them, because they were being loyal to them, because they were on their team. That's one thing. It's what Romans says, that some people will even die for a righteous person or a good person. Now let's talk about it from the gospel standpoint. Let's say that a rescue team is formed and they go into this prisoner camp and they're going to rescue their men and women that have been held captive. And one of the enemies throws a grenade in during the rescue attempt. And instead of somebody on the United States side diving on it, somebody from the enemy side goes and jumps on the grenade to save the enemy. <laughs> Y'all are looking at me like somebody would be crazy. We'd think they were somehow infiltrated by the enemy. They were somehow working for the other side. Once you think about this, we consider that crazy that somebody would go dive on a grenade to save the enemy, but Jesus did that for you and me. To understand the love of God, we've got to understand the gospel that we were enemies of God. We weren't his friend yet. We haven't been saved yet. We are ungodly, under the wrath of God. We deserve hell forever. We're his enemies. We're working for the enemy. We're not working for God. And God, while we were yet sinners came and died for us, the enemy, so that we could have a chance to be reconciled to God. If you understand the gospel, how can you not love God and want to live for him? We're his enemies. We deserve what enemies deserve. Death, separation forever. I put an Old Testament passage here that I love next on your handout. 
Zephaniah 3, 16. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. Verse 17, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He'll rejoice over you with gladness. And notice this next phrase, he will quiet you by his love. He will leave you in awe that he loves us while we were his enemies, that Christ would die for us. He will exult over you with loud singing. We ought to be in awe of the love of God. We ought to stand speechless when we think about the fact that God chose us when we were his enemies. God chose to love us when he didn't need us. God chose to love us while we were his enemy. God chose to love us while we were his enemy, and he did it at such a high cost, the life of his only son. If somebody tells you that Jesus doesn't love you, then they don't understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. God loves you. God loves me. And while we were enemies, he still sent his son to die for you and me. Why? Because we need salvation. What do we need salvation from? the wrath of God that should be poured out on us in a place called hell forever for our sins. And the last thing I want you to see, and please pay attention to this part, God's love reveals who we are without Christ. God's love defines who God is. God's love shows me what God has done for me on the cross at Calvary. And God's love finally shows me what my response should be back to God. We're not saved by our works. I'm not trying to be legalistic. I'm not trying to teach that we should do all these things. No, we ought to do all these things because we love God. Romans 5.11, the last verse in our text this morning. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We ought to rejoice. We ought to live a life of rejoicing to God because he has reconciled us. We were separated forever from God. He, he brought us back by the blood of Jesus Christ and the cross at Calvary. I put 1 John 4, 19 on your handout. We love because he first loved us. He has proven his love for us. There's nothing else Jesus has to do to prove his love to us. He didn't have to give you more things, bigger house, nicer car, more money, it's not a, you can have your best life now mentality. No, Christ has already given you everything you need for you to understand that he loves you. He gave his self on the cross at Calvary, the greatest gift of all. He's shown his love. He's proved it to us. We love because he first loved us. And boy, has he demonstrated that to us. So what should our response be back? If we love him because he first loved us, how do we show that love to God. Number one, I should love God with everything that I have. The greatest commandment, Matthew 22, 36, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Verse 37, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. How do we respond back to God? Because of what he's done for us, we love him with everything in us. Does it, I, I'm going to get on my soapbox for just a minute. That means we love him more than sports. That means we love him more than hobbies. That means we love him more than our spouse. That means we love him more than our children. That means we love him more than we love the church. That means we love him more than religion. That means we love him more than anything. That's the greatest commandment. Because he loved us and proved it to us by his death, burial, and resurrection, by paying what we should go to hell forever and pay, we love him back, and we can't love him back half-heartedly. He loved us with everything, and we understand the gospel, we love him back with everything. Everything in our being. Number two, we love him with everything, and we should love others as well. The greatest commandment, Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine, 39. says... And second is like the first, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. First John 4, 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. First Peter 4, 8, above all, 
keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Scripture is very clear. We cannot say we love God if we hate our brother and our sister. We love God with everything and that shows up by the way we love other people. Number three, pay careful attention to this one. I show my response back to God for all he's done for me by the way I love myself. I don't mean that egotistically. I don't mean that selfishly. We understand who we are when God has saved us. We understand that his righteousness has been placed inside of us. And so we understand that we are worth something, not because of anything we have done, but because of what Christ has done on our behalf. Scripture is very clear. You have to love others as you love yourself. You know why some people can't love other people? Because they don't love themselves. They might love themselves selfishly. They might be egotistical about themselves. They might be braggadocious about themselves, but they don't understand that they have value and their value is not based on who they are or what they do. Their value is based on what Christ has done for them by saving them, by reconciling them. We are precious saints of God. We're his children. We're his friends when he saves us. We have value not because of anything special about us, everything special about him. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then you don't hate yourself. You love who Christ has made you and saved you into being. You can't love someone else unless you love yourself. And the fourth response back to God, Chuck just sang about it. What a powerful message in song. I should tell others about his love. Instead of being silent, Instead of living in a country that's being silent for the most part about Christ and what he's done for us and how we should tell a lost and dying world about him, my response to God because of what he's done for me is I can't help but witness to this lost and dying world. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ controls us. I think the NIV says for the love of Christ compels us. I like that word control. When the Holy Spirit controls you, you do certain things. You can be compelled to do something but never get around to doing it. But when God controls you, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Because of what Christ has done for us, we are saved by him because we've repented of our sin and placed our trust in him by his grace, by his mercy, by his helping us to understand the gospel, we have become true believers in Jesus Christ and now Christ controls us and we must tell a lost and dying world. I think it was Spurgeon who had a quote that I can't remember word for word but basically said, how can people say they're Christians if they never tell a lost word about Jesus? How can they say they love Jesus Christ and talk about everything else they love but not Jesus Christ? 2 Corinthians 5, 20, later on in that same passage. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. God in his perfect plan decided to make his appeal to the lost and dying world through his children. Somebody told you about Jesus Christ. Somebody introduced you to who you are apart from Christ, what Christ has done for you, so that you could see that you needed salvation that can only be found through Christ. We implore you, we beg you, the literal Greek, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Should you urge people to be saved? Should you beg people to be saved? If you have a lost family member, lost wife, lost husband, life, lost children, lost mother or father, lost brother or sister, and you knew today was the last day they'd live on this planet, and you knew they would split hell wide open if they were to die today, and you knew today was their day they would die, would you urge them to get saved? Would you beg them? Would you plead with them? This is personal to me. I know people distant in my family that are lost without Christ. I know they are. I know one right now who's very, very sick. The other day I was trying to share with this person that was sick and they said, leave me alone. I don't want to talk about it. I urged them 
to make the decision to trust in Christ. I can't save anybody. It's by the power of Almighty God. I can't make somebody make the decision. It's got to be by the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And that person has to want to trust in Christ as Lord and Savior. It can't be manipulated. It can't be forced. But I was sharing with this person and another relative of mine said, just leave them alone. Don't talk to them about it. And they got upset with me. And I walked away going, but they're dying. They don't know Christ. The reality of that, the reality that I have a loved one that could go to hell forever. How can we not tell the lost and dying world? How can we not plead with them? How can we not beg them? Because we've understood the grace that has been given to us and we understand who they are like we were apart from Christ. They're still his enemy. They're still under his wrath and they haven't been saved from his wrath and they will literally, truly go to a real hell forever. How can we say we believe that and not share the lost dying word about Jesus? How can we say we understand what Christ has done for us and not want him to do the same for someone else? Once again, I think so many people try to manipulate somebody to salvation. I think so many times the church, not First Baptist Church, Lodell, but the church as a whole, Christian church as a whole, has done a huge disservice to people and falsely led people into thinking they were saved and never been saved. Because we have all these plans of salvation. Admit, believe, confess. A, B, C. You walk through those A, B, Cs, you'll go to heaven. Walk the aisle. Say the prayer. We introduce a lot of people to the plan of salvation, and nowhere in the scriptures will you see a plan of salvation, but you will see the man of salvation, Jesus Christ. People prolong invitations and tell people, I've, I've been in service before. Somebody called somebody out by name and told them to come on down. They need to get saved. You can't coerce salvation. You can't force salvation. It's the prompting of the Holy Spirit. But I think it's okay to plead with people to be saved because there's the urgency in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So don't misunderstand me. If we love people, we want them to know the greatest gift of all, and that gift is Jesus. But they have to make the decision to trust in Christ. They have to turn from their sins. You can't do it for them. You can't force it upon them. You can't guilt them into it. You can't scare them into going to hell so they'll come to know Jesus Christ. It has to be a real decision but people are missing out on the greatest love of all the love of God God's love shows me who I am I am apart from Christ ungodly, wretched sinful, his enemy I deserve his wrath God's love shows me who God really is that while I was still a sinner Christ died for me while I was his enemy he gave it up for his enemy in me and in you. God's love shows me what he's done for me. He's justified me by his blood. He's reconciled me. He's brought me back in when I've been separated from him. And God's love also shows me what I should do in response to him. I should love him with everything that I have. I should love others. I should love myself and see who I am in Christ. And I should love the lost and dying world enough to share the gospel with them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.